Chapter 15, Treatment, Part 1. This is the full video of my lecture for the Substance Use Disorder Counseling and Chemical Dependency classes. In this video, we begin our discussion of how it is professionals go about treating clients with substance use disorder. One chapter in a textbook or one video can't begin to cover all the material that has been developed over the last 75 to 80 years in the field. In an effort to give my students a better understanding of how treatment is done, I split the chapter into two sections, hence two videos. While these two videos help beginning substance use disorder counselors develop the knowledge base they need, the skills to be a good counselor are developed on the job through gaining experience and having good clinical supervision. Think of this like uh, when I first began to drive, the car had an instruction booklet in the glove compartment, probably 30 pages or so about how a car worked. Reading that booklet is a long way from making me able to be my own mechanic and fix my car. It's the same way in learning the skills and vocabulary to be a good counselor This video is by David Joel Miller. Some of the material was presented on counselorsoapbox.com, my blog. The photos here are courtesy of pixabay.com and Wikimedia Commons and licensed under the Creative Commons free for use, no attribution required license. This video covers some things about recovery you will need to know. This is a preview of the chapter on recovery and some ideas you will need in order to work in the recovery field. We'll return to the topic in the next video when we cover the balance of chapter 15. We'll begin with a brief tour of recovery land. Remember, the roots of substance abuse treatment are in the recovery movement, the self-help movement. Many people who work in professional mental health treatment have had very little exposure to that recovery mindset and recovery community. Recovery land has a very particular culture. One of the big factors is Alcoholics Anonymous, both the book and the fellowships and meetings. So while I can't give you a whole lot about AA in a short video, a little bit about AA history. It began as a self-help group uh, in the late 1930s. And it began by collecting together a number of alcoholics who met, often in people's kitchens, drank coffee and talked among themselves and developed a system for recovery and for supporting each other in recovery. So AA provides both a 12-step system and that, if you study it, can be understood as a uh, therapeutic model. The steps were derived from sound psychological principles at the time. And it also provides ongoing uh, support system of other recovered people that uh, you can associate with. Part of the program that developed, while it's not in the original Alcoholics Anonymous textbook, uh, includes the idea of sponsors and sponsorship. And this came about at one of the meetings in which they found so many newcomers were wanting to arrive that if all the new people who were still drinking came, it would turn into a group of alcoholics who were still practicing rather than a group that was recovering. And as a result, they created the first speakers meeting and the idea that people who had some time in the program would help others, sponsor others to come to the everyday meeting rather than the once a week speakers meeting. There are three separate twelves that people who are involved with Alcoholics Anonymous are aware of. The twelve steps, originally the twelve steps were three steps which were then expanded to six and finally to twelve. Every alcoholic of course was looking for the loophole. Besides the 12 steps, which is a process of recovery, there are 12 traditions where the rules that uh, groups are governed by. 
and there are the 12 concepts of world service. It's important to understand to those who have not been involved in a self-help group, and AA, while it's the granddaddy of the fellowships, the self-help movement, there are now over 200 12-step meetings, uh, groups that have come about as a result of uh, using the AA model and modifying the steps for other problems. But one of the things that I want students to understand is the difference between a meeting and a fellowship. A meeting is something that occurs once a week. It might, or several times a week, but it, it usually occurs at a church or a bank or a school, and it ha meets at that time and that's it. A fellowship is a group of uh, members of Alcoholics Anonymous, and by the way, you're a member if you say you are. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. Uh, so the members get together, they rent a room, and there might be a meeting uh, every morning, every noon, every evening, uh, more on the weekend. There are a lot of meetings that occur in that one room. And there is never anything else, unlike a school or a church where there are other activities and AA simply rents the room in the fellowship hall once a week. I encourage people new to recovery to check out some fellowships if they're available, because that means that once you go there, you know that any night of the week that you need to go to a meeting, there is likely to be a meeting available at that location. Originally, there were no AA meetings. The book, Alcoholics Anonymous, was purchased either in a bookstore or by mail order, and people read it, and as a result of following the simple principles in it, got sober. But as more and more people had read the book and got sober, meetings sprung up. Originally, more like a book club that read the book, discussed it, and tried to help each other. There are many different types of AA meetings in different parts of the country. They have different personalities. Even within a town, you may have some in the richer parts of town and some in the very poor parts. I've seen meetings in our town, one in which people arrive in their BMWs and their Lexus and they come to the noon meeting. And if you haven't been sober for 20 or 30 years, you probably won't be called on to speak. Another meeting in a very poor part of town, you see homeless people park their shopping cart in front of the meeting and come in and share. So each meeting has its personality. Open meetings are those that anyone who wants to come can come to, whether you're an alcoholic or not. Most fellowships are open because they encourage people who are unfamiliar with Alcoholics Anonymous to come, listen, and understand what's happening here. There are a few closed meetings which are for alcoholics and only. Some seem to have a particular theme. Some closed meetings may be for doctors or lawyers or police officers. Some of these aren't even on the schedule but are referred uh, specifically. There are women's only meetings and in early recovery I encourage women to go to at least one women's only meeting, more if possible. Um, one of the dangers in AA, uh, in any 12-step program, is the way in which people develop a new love interest, sometimes called the 13th step. The idea that if they just met the right person, fell in love, had sex, then they would no longer want to drink. Well, attending a men's only, or in the case of uh, uh, women's only, or in the case of men, a stag meeting, a men's only meeting, takes some of that hooking up and and using uh, love and sex as another drug out of the picture. There are speaker meetings where various people get up and talk, people with years of sobriety. There are young people's meetings designed for teenagers or even younger. There are smoking and non-smoking. More and more meetings are going non-smoking uh, indoors because of health concerns. Uh, frequently, you'll see a lot of the smokers out in the parking lot. Some meetings even have smoke breaks partway through. There are open participation meetings where people can talk about anything they want. A large number of the meetings are what are called book studies. People might uh, read a section from the big book, meaning the book titled Alcoholics Anonymous. 
Uh, you see it here with the original circus jacket cover. Uh, the idea there was to make it very attractive for people to buy in bookstores. After that first uh, edition, they discovered that people bought it and took that paper cover off immediately. Subsequent editions all come with a dark blue cover and no paper jacket uh, or no obvious paper jacket. There's another book called 12 and 12, the 12 steps and the 12 traditions. And people might read a paragraph or two from that and then discuss it. And there's a smaller book called As Bill Sees It, which are collected writings of Bill W., one of the early founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. So book studies may be an important part of the meetings, but so are open participation and other types. There's a particular AA culture, and I'm focusing here on AA, but the same thing is true of Narcotics Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, and so on. We need to think of culture in a broader sense than simply race or ethnicity. People who are in the drug using culture all know certain expressions. Uh, alcoholics know probably three or four bartenders by their first name. And they all know straight up on the rocks, beer back, chaser, etc. People who use injectable drugs know the expression going to the cotton. So what makes up culture? Culture is the language you use, the way you dress, uh, the food you eat, and so on. So each 12-step uh, group has developed a sort of culture, and there's a culture of recovery. People who get into recovery usually give up their uh, themed beer-themed or marijuana-themed t-shirts. They get rid of those little pot leaf uh, emblems that were hanging from their rearview mirror. They began to change where they go. They don't stop by the bar or the crack house. And so gradually they shift from a culture of using an addiction to a culture of recovery. When people go to the uh, AA meeting, there is typically a sequence. Uh, there are readings. The secretary or chairman will hand out some uh, brief readings for people to do. There may be a sign-in sheet that's sent around. Remember, the sign-in sheet is not a type of attendance. They should be shredded or destroyed after the meeting. It's a way of helping whoever is chairing the reading know uh, the meeting, know who to call on to read various passages. If you don't want to be uh, reading or talking, you simply don't sign in and pass the sheet on. Uh, when I send students to meetings, I tell them the proper response if they're called on is simply to say, uh, either to introduce themselves as a student or to simply say, I just want to listen, and that's perfectly okay. There's no going back to find out who was at an AA meeting last Wednesday night as the sign-in sheets are destroyed after the meeting in an effort to preserve anonymity. The seventh tradition came about uh, a long time back, and there's a long story about that, but uh, the idea being that AA does not, or AA meetings, do not accept large gifts from anyone who is not a member. They don't accept large gifts from members. Members are limited in what they can give each year, and if you're not a member, they ask you not to contribute. The idea being that if there was a, a particular religious group that sponsored an AA meeting or a political group or something else, then they would begin to control the meeting, and that could end up destroying the focus on not drinking and recovery. So at each meeting, they pass the basket, and the money should be enough that uh, the meeting can pay its bills, rent the room, pay for coffee or whatever they do, and so on. If they don't collect enough money, well, the meeting stops existing, and some other meeting may open up somewhere else. Court cards are a common expression. Court cards are not a part of AA's traditions. They're something imposed from outside. Each secretary decides in each meeting how they're going to handle it. Court cards may be a specific document that a judge tells someone to go to meetings, AA or NA, and get signatures and prove they're attending as part of their staying out of jail. But uh, for general purposes, there's no such thing as a court card. A court card is 
any piece of paper that someone brings, puts their name on, turns into the secretary at the beginning of the meeting, sits through it, then at some point, probably the end, the secretary will sign the cards and, or the papers and give it back to people. I ask my students when they go to attend a meeting to have that experience, just like what they would assign one of their clients. Go turn in a piece of paper. It's kind of embarrassing the first time you do it. Get it signed. Bring it back to me to prove that they sat through the meeting. There's also a lot of people who resist Alcoholics Anonymous saying they don't believe in, in a particular deity or they don't aren't religious or they're atheists. It's important to remember that uh, early on, AA decided that they weren't going to mix religion with recovery. And while many members believe in God as a specific higher power, uh, there are AA meetings in countries which are of various religions. Uh, Buddhists would refer to this as, as the good. Uh, and so there's no real requirement that you have a religious belief, only that you believe there is some standard of right and wrong beyond your own decision making. If you're an alcoholic, your decision making wasn't too good. And in early recovery, many people will use the steps or the meeting or some other thing. So your preconceived notions about religion shouldn't keep someone from attending Alcoholics Anonymous and seeing if the 12-step method and the support system there will help them in their recovery. Another theoretical model that beginning uh, substance use disorder counselors should be familiar with is the ABCDE model. Originally, it was designed by a man named Albert Ellis. Uh, it's part of the basic uh, thinking of cognitive behavioral therapy or rational emotive behavioral therapy, both cognitive models of thinking. And the ABCDE, or sometimes it's only called the ABCD model, is often used in things like anger management, but it's very helpful for substance use disorders and many other pr problems. So here's a quick uh, run through the model and some an example taken from anger management, but that could be applied to other issues. In this model, there's an activating event. Something happens to me, not something I do, but but something happens to me. Let me give you a slightly embellished uh, example of this. Let's say that I was working at a particular place in town and I have to drive across town to uh, another location to do something. As I come to the traffic light and begin to make my turn, someone in a brand new car, let's call it a Lexus, goes barreling through the red light almost hits me, I have to swerve to get out of their way, and they go on through the light. The activating event, them running the light and almost hitting me, has the consequence that they have made me angry. So let's say that since they made me angry, I decide to teach them a lesson. I hop in, I'm in my car, I get in the inside lane and I drive as fast as I can and I'm going to catch up with this uh, person who has done this to me. I move my old beat up work van slightly ahead and into their lane, forcing them off the road into the dirt. And I hop out of my old beat up work van, run to the back and remove from it a large piece of uh, pipe that I used to carry in that van to assist people who didn't behave correctly in doing the thing I wanted them to do. And I look at this brand new Lexus and it's July and it's really hot outside. And I say, I know what is wrong. Obviously this person's air conditioner isn't working. And as a result, the, their brain has become overheated and they can no longer think rationally. That's why they went through the red light and almost killed me and made me angry. So I'm going to be helpful. I'm going to go back 
and with my piece of pipe remove all the surplus glass along the side of their car and cool the idiot off. See what's going on here? As I'm about to do this, the person jumps out of the car and the first thing they say to me is, I am so sorry, I am so sorry. I just got a call from the hospital. My mother is in the intensive care unit and they say that she's dying. And if I don't get there in the next 15 minutes or so, I may not get to be uh, able to be say goodbye to her. How do I feel now? I feel a little sorry for this man. Wait, 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 no, that's not right. That can't be right. He went through the light. He almost killed me. He made me angry. Why am I not angry here? Huh. What we discover as we work through this model, and for many people, it's very difficult to accept at first, but once you recognize it, between the activating event, what the person did, and the consequence, how I felt, there's an intervening belief, my belief about why this happened, why this person did this to me. And my belief about why it happened is a direct uh, cause of the consequence. So if I believe that he was uh, reckless, went through the light, disrespected me, I have every right to be angry. But if I believe that he was hurrying to get to the hospital because his mother was dying, I feel sorry for him. Now, does it matter which is true? Will I ever know? Probably not. I can choose which belief I have, and when I choose to believe the poor guy's in a rush to get to the hospital, I'm not angry. He didn't make me angry. I angered myself uh, as a result of uh, my beliefs about what's going on. I can choose to believe he's disrespectful and be angry and get in a fight, or I can choose to believe he's in a hurry to get to the hospital, and I'm not angry, and we both go on our way. The key in this model is to recognize that my belief causes the consequence, the emotion I'm experiencing, not the other person's actions. So whenever I become angry, I have the choice. I can be angry, act out, and pay the consequence, or I can engage a deed, disputing, arguing, I can ask myself, what other belief could I have? And as a result of that other belief, I may get a different result. My questioning, my belief, my disputing can result in a new effective belief. That effective new belief alters the way I'm feeling. So whenever this happens, uh, I have a every opportunity to change my belief, and I can now have a new belief. This effective new belief creates a new consequence, how I can feel if I choose to. While it's a difficult lesson to learn sometimes, this is an important one. Once I realize that nobody ever makes me angry, I choose to anger myself when they don't do what I want them to do, then I have, I can go through life without getting angry. Now, sometimes stupid people do stupid things and I can be angry at them or I can simply say to myself, ah, there's another idiot, lots of them around. And what are idiots supposed to do? Stupid things. Let me give you another quick example from my own experiences of this A, B, C, D, E uh, model. I was teaching a class in a large auditorium, uh, slope seating, kind of theater seating, and I was giving this wonderful lecture, probably the best, most brilliant lecture of my career. I had, could see all the students just spellbound, and suddenly this one woman sitting in the very front row slams her book closed, and goes, grabs her things and goes running up the aisle, slamming the door behind her. I became very angry. I, you know, what kind of, what did this woman do that for? What do you think? She got a text, maybe a hot date. Uh, did I say something to offend her? 
What happened here? Well, I determined that the next week when I saw her, I was going to have a talk with her, tell her that was unacceptable. If she was going to leave in the middle of my lecture, she needed to sit in the back right by the door. Better yet, if she wasn't going to stay for the whole thing, uh, she could just not come to class at all. As I'm unlocking the door the next week, the woman comes up to me and says, Professor Miller, I'm so sorry about last week. I'm thinking to myself, you should be sorry, lady. <laughs> she said, you know, I, I was running late last week. I stopped at that, that coach, that food thing out on the street. I probably shouldn't have had that day-old fish taco, but suddenly my stomach got really upset. Suddenly, now that I have a new belief about why she jumped up and ran out of my classroom, it's no longer she disrespected me, but rather it, what happened here is that uh, sh she had a upset stomach. I'm glad she left in a hurry. I don't want to have to clean that up or smell it the rest of the evening. See, my belief about why she left changes the, the consequence whether I'm angry at her, upset at her, or whether I'm really sorry for her. The result is that whenever something like this occurs, I have a chance to think it over, come up with another effective uh, belief by disputing what I'm thinking. Mostly, it's I find that I get upset and angry, or have in the past, when someone didn't do what I wanted them to do, or did something I didn't want them to do. And when I simply accept, accept that they're different people and they may behave differently than I do, that changes everything. So if you practice this model, you will very soon learn that no one can control, push your buttons and control your feelings. They may do things you don't like. You may have to set boundaries and shove them out of your life or reduce your contact with them but you don't have to be hurt or angry. As counselors move through their training, there are other curriculum they may be called on to use. We find the best results come when all the counselors, and usually there's a staff of counselors delivering this treatment, mainly in group settings uh, to their clients, the best results come when there's a curriculum and each counselor sticks to the curriculum. There are many of these that are available free from SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, uh, and you can go to the SAMHSA.gov site. Now, not all uh, evidence-based practices are equal. Some are better than others, but two that I've uh, looked at and used that may be very helpful, and if you're program adopts these, they can be very useful. The Matrix is a curriculum that has many handouts uh, designed originally for treating stimulant use disorders, but here in California, the majority of people who come to treatment are there because of methamphetamine use. Uh, stimulants are the big problem, and even those people with an alcohol or a heroin usage often have been dabbling in stimulant drugs also. There's also an interesting one, and I think we're going to see more use of it in the future, uh, possibly more use of it in online uh, counseling. But there is a brief counseling for marijuana dependency. We used to think that marijuana smoking or use did not result in any kind of withdrawal symptoms. What we found is that it does, and that the major withdrawal symptom for marijuana is a, an increase in anxiety. People believe they're smoking marijuana to reduce their anxiety, but as soon as they stop smoking it, their anxiety returns in an even worse way. Well, the BCMD curriculum provides a, a method of treating those people uh, who have a specific marijuana issue. We noticed that uh, often the courts would send people to drug treatment and we would have some hardcore heroin users, some chronic alcoholics, and a few people whose only drug of choice was marijuana. And they really felt they weren't getting anything out of treatment because they weren't drug users or alcoholics. They just smoked a little weed and had gotten caught. 
the specific uh, curriculum may be helpful to them uh, to understand the problems from marijuana and to decide whether they want to try to control their usage, reduce it, or discontinue it altogether. This will be a quick review of the various therapies that might be used in treatment. Some of them are much more common than others. Most substance use disorder treatment programs combine a number of these different therapies. Uh, seeing these in a classroom, uh, reading a chapter in a book that covers these various therapies is not the same as getting experience in them. But this will at least give you a roadmap to the journey you're going to take if you're becoming a counselor and learning various therapies. One that's been tried with, I think, limited success is aversion therapy. You can shock people. You can give them a, a drug that when a pill that they take, that when they drink alcohol, they get violently ill. You can do things like arrest them and lock them up in prison, all things to punish their use in an effort to get them to stop. But one of the fundamental characteristics of substance use and behavioral addictions is that after a period of use, the brain adapts to it, begins to demand it, and chronic alcoholics given a drug to make them nauseous and vomit uh, will either stop taking the medication, spit it out if they can, or drink a little alcohol until they get violently ill and throw up, and then they will be able to begin drinking again. So generally, aversion therapy is not used to any great extent. There's a thing called 12-step facilitation, which is common in substance use disorder treatment programs. Therapy may last uh, a few hours each day, uh, maybe 28-day or 30-day rehab, but what happens afterwards? Well, the follow-up, the continuing care, and an addiction is a chronic disease, just like diabetes. You gotta take your meds or your insulin. So what's your ongoing treatment? Attending 12-step groups. The counselor in this system would teach the steps, not work them with the clients, but teach them what the steps are. Part of the shift from moving from uh, the land of addiction to recovery land is you need new behavioral skills. So certain skills, um, how to, uh, I've had clients who've never been on a date or never had sex without having drugs and alcohol in their system and are scared to death. Uh, they need something to take the edge off. So they may need to learn social skills. Behavioral skills are often based on learning theory. That is, you learn a new skill, you practice it over and over until it becomes your default setting. Otherwise, under times of stress, people revert to their old method, their old pattern, and that would be to drink alcohol or pick up drugs. Another thing that can be done as a therapy is motivational enhancement, sometimes uh, called motivational interviewing, and it's covered in another place in the textbook and in the videos. But finding ways to help the client develop a plan for what their life would look like without the drugs or alcohol. There's also some use of medical replacement therapy. It's uh, especially helpful for something like nicotine, smoking, the patch, reduces the craving and gets the person to reduce their consumption. It's also been used for uh, drugs that have a severe uh, withdrawal syndrome, such as heroin or the opiates. Another important therapy that's used in treatment is to teach relapse prevention. Relapse is best conceived of as a process, not uh, an event. Often people begin to think about relapse. It starts in the mind as they begin to think, well, maybe I could just do it one more time, or they begin to experience cravings. So talking about cravings is a normal part of the recovery process. Uh, and support systems, how does your support system encourage you to stay clean and sober, or how does it encourage you to pick up and use again? We tend to do the same things as the people we spend the most time with. So it's important to consider uh, relapse prevention. One of the models I particularly like is Marlott's discussion of how 
urges, cravings, and there may be a distinction in there, but they are kind of like surfing the waves. What happens is the urge, the craving goes up and up and up. And most people feel, I can't stand it. I'm, and I'll just do it once and they give in and they do their drug or drink uh, one beer, and of course, after one beer, they want more, and after one drug use, they're on a run. Every time you give in to a craving, you reinforce it. If you can approach relapse prevention more like surfing the waves, they go up. If you ride them long enough, you the wave will go down, and eventually, you're standing on the beach safe. So that's very important. Another distinction that we probably should look at, we don't talk enough about, is the distinction between willpower and won't power. Uh, lots of people think that uh, recovery from drug use or alcoholism is simply having enough willpower not to do it. That's not what willpower is at all. Willpower is making yourself do something unpleasant now for future benefit. Uh, I found that when I get up in the morning, I have an ounce and a half worth of willpower. If I am going to get anything done today, I need to clean the cat box first thing. If I need to pay bills, I better do it right away. Because if I get started on a writing project, the day will disappear, and I will never have gotten to those unpleasant things I didn't want to do. Uh, people find that it's a very different skill they need to uh, go to a gym than it is to do the exercises once they are. Now, won't power is very different. Uh, as I walk by the kitchen each day, I would swear that that chocolate cake on the counter there is calling my name. David, come get some more cake. And won't power is not doing something pleasant now, which will have negative consequences in the future. So won't power would be don't stop at the bar on the way home just to say hi because you will end up drinking. Whereas willpower is making yourself do something that you didn't really want to do, like go to a 12-step meeting. Learning to uh, apply these two can be very helpful. There's a saying in recovery circles, HALT, which is a way of understanding relapse triggers. HALT describes hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Uh, one way of seeing this is inside and outside triggers. And so if you understand that uh, physical sensations, hunger, uh, and loneliness, being tired, uh, all of those kinds of things, internal and external, can be triggers that might lead you to relapse. So you want to get enough sleep, uh, you want to make sure you eat and drink water, and you also want to reach out for positive connections. Um, another way of looking at this problem of relapse is cognitively, we think about unhelpful thoughts, and many people have lots of unhelpful thoughts. I'm either perfect or I'm no good, black and white thinking. Uh, I must do this and I shouldn't do that, and those sorts of things talked elsewhere about the recovery lifestyle and the culture of recovery, but for many people this is such a novel uh, understanding that they really need to study it to see how the culture they've been living is different from the culture they will want to live in recovery. There's some other treatment approaches that people should be aware of. Th therapeutic communities, um, were back in the early days, there's still a few in existence. The idea here is that just like AA and NA began as self-help groups meeting in kitchens, therapeutic communities uh, would get a building where people could live, a kind of halfway house, uh, and the people who were in the program graduated and became the staff. So in therapeutic communities, the residents really had a large part in running it. Uh, there's still a few of these models around, but as insurance came in, rather than wanting a, a group of addicts to rent an apartment and all live together and try to keep each other clean, uh, insurance and other funding sources wanted to see professionals running the program. There's been an increase in new media, uh, things like Facebook and, and other uh, types of online things, distance counseling. 
this has exploded as a result of the coronavirus, but it's been coming for a long time. Some people can't make it to meetings, either physically or distance-wise. They're in remote areas. And so in the future, I think we're going to do a lot more with distance, with telephonic and, and uh, video conferencing and so on. Uh, there are web-based programs that people can uh, get it, download an app that will send them reminders, positive affirmations, and so on. And I think we're just beginning to develop web-based uh, uh, treatment approaches. There's also uh, an important adjunct, uh, even in secular programs, often spiritual, uh, faith-based sorts of things, reinforcing people's connection with whatever they believe their higher power is, uh, can be very helpful. Meditation, and I think most people misunderstand meditation. It's, it's not about sitting, uh, chanting, uh, though some people do that as part of their meditation practice. Meditation is really about just clearing your mind uh, and thinking deeply about things. Mindfulness is about living in the moment, not ch having your mind go running off into the past. Why did this have to happen or the future? And it's very important to understand stress, the role it plays in our lives, how to reduce it, how to manage it. Um, stress isn't all bad, you know, you need a certain amount of stress hormones uh, in your muscles to help them move so you can get out of bed in the morning. But if the amount of stress you have through the day becomes excessive, that can be harmful. So learning to manage stress or reduce it is another important treatment approach. Other treatment approaches or activities uh, include uh, clean and sober events. Many people have never been to a social event without drinking or using. There are clean and sober uh, dances and parties and New Year's Eve without alcohol or drugs. Many people don't really know how to have fun. Uh, if you didn't learn to play and have fun as a child, and many people in recovery didn't or didn't correctly, uh, you may not know how to have fun without using drugs, alcohol, or sex. So learning to enjoy things, learning to focus on fitness and well-being, smoking cessation can be an important part of a recovery program, and sometimes weight loss is also a part of uh, people's recovery of trying to get into shape and feel better about themselves and feel healthier. For a long time, we couldn't figure out exactly how people changed because it seemed that people and businesses change. And then if nothing uh, maintains that change, they revert right back to the way they were before. For example, there was a lot of funding available for school districts to try to raise test scores. Most of those districts, as long as the money flowed and the new programs went on, the test scores went up. But as soon as the funding stopped, everybody reverted to their old way of doing things and the test scores returned to their old low levels. But some districts, some businesses, and some people seem to be able to make a change and to maintain it. So uh, a number of professors on the East Coast, uh, Norcross, Prochesca, and De Clementi, uh, studied this, wrote some books, Changing for Good is one, and they described a kind of trans-theoretical, it includes all theories about how people change and a model that may explain it. In the stages of change model, clients begin by being pre-contemplated. They don't realize they have a problem, and even if they did, they aren't thinking about changing it. By providing them with information, they may move into the next stage, which is contemplating. Contemplating is thinking about it, talking about it, but not actually taking action. After a while, with help, the client may move into the determination or preparation stage. In substance abuse, this would be they would start attending meetings, maybe buy a book, but they haven't actually read the book or gotten a sponsor or worked any steps. After some period of time, those people who do change get into action. They begin to take steps, uh, work the 12 steps or go to therapy, 
They begin to look at themselves and work on changing their behaviors. Eventually, people begin to see the results of their change. Some people, after they've stopped using, will say, well, I haven't had a drink in a month. I'm cured. Unfortunately, when they stopped doing action steps, many of those people move directly into relapse. Ideally, in the stages of change model, we want people from action to move into some form of maintenance. People who stay connected to whatever helped them get better, going to 12-step meetings and working their steps, having a sponsor, seeing a counselor or therapist, or spiritual activities, People who continue these steps and these processes are in maintenance, and that maintenance keeps them clean and sober as the habit of not using or drinking becomes permanent. Those people who discontinue these activities frequently move from there back into relapse and may repeat the entire cycle multiple times. Motivational interviewing, sometimes called motivational enhancement therapy, uh, is another technique which counselors need to learn. It can be very helpful. Let me try to explain it from a personal experience. Had a client come in and say, uh, for an intake, and sit down and say, I really don't need to be here. I said, oh, cool. It's not often that a client comes in and doesn't need to be here. I mean, people don't show up at the cancer center asking to do some chemotherapy, even though they don't have cancer. So I said, so why are you here if you don't need to be here? He said, because the judge uh, sent me. I said, oh, well, what happened? He said, well, I, I got caught with some meth. Oh, okay. Well, what would you like to do about that? He, he said, well, I, you know, as soon as I get done with this probation thing, I'm going to go back out and use. I mean, I've already decided I'm going to use. I said, okay. So what do you want to accomplish here? He said, well, I want to get off probation. Out comes my treatment plan, and I write down goal number one, get off probation. I said, well, what would you need to do to get off probation? He said, well, I would need to uh, complete a program. I said, well, do you think you could do the program? Our program is 90 days. He said, yeah, I can do that, no problem. I said, okay, I wrote down, do drug program 90 days. I said, anything else they want you to do? He said, yeah, I'm going to have to test every week. I, well, you, you're going to be able to do that? I said, yeah. And he says, yeah. So I, I write it down, test at probation every week. I said, it, it, will probation care whether the tests are clean or dirty? He said, oh, yeah, they got to be clean. I said, oh, okay. So uh, he, I said, can you do that? He said, yeah, I'll do that. So I write down as a goal, test clean every week. Have I told this client to do anything? No. I've simply asked him what he wants to accomplish. We've laid out a series of goals, and he's going to attempt it. Now, if he finds through the program that he relapses and uses, then we're going to have to explore that and set new goals. But whenever the counselor can get the client to set goals, and then you simply support them in those goals, treatment moves so much better. Well, in motivational interviewing, you want to explore and resolve ambivalence. That might be, what are the good things about using? What are the bad? What would be the good things about not using? What would be the bad aspects? So you want to build help, hope. Uh, many of our clients don't believe that they are capable of changing. Sometimes uh, you have to get their self-esteem back up to zero in order to uh, for them to believe they're capable of changing because they've been beaten down so much. Whenever possible, you want to elicit change talk. If the client says that they're going to do something out loud to another person, then they have a real stake in doing it. You don't want to confront them in a negative way, not hostile. Uh, there are some confrontation techniques that can be done just to point things out, but never to uh, try to force them to agree with you or do something. Sometimes, uh, them recognizing they have a disorder or a disease can be empowering, but you want to avoid labeling them as bad people, defective, drug addicts, what do you expect? And especially the counselor wants to avoid getting into arguments with the client. 
They're not productive for you and they only make the client dig their heels in and resist what you're trying to get them to do. In motivational interviewing, there are some traps the counselor has to avoid. One is the question answer. You ask a question, they give you an answer. You ask another question back and forth like the ping pong. Confrontation, well, you really need to quit drinking. No, I'm not that, mine is not that bad. Uh, the yes, but, yes, I do, but now is not the time. No, but, you know, those answers. It's also difficult. It's a challenge, I think, for most counselors to avoid the expert role. Uh, yes, we can be guides to recovery land, kind of tour directors, but the client is the expert on their life and they know what they've been through and what they have to do. We want to avoid labeling them with uh, pejorative kinds of negative kinds of labels. Avoiding a premature focus like they should be all clean and, and recovered within a week, you know, stop using drugs, get a new job, uh, move into a new apartment, start a new romance, all, oh, and go back to school and get a degree. Yeah, let's get that done by Friday. And it's very important not to make people uh, feel worse about themselves. That blame, uh, shame kind of uh, system only makes it harder for people to recover. Some other principles of motivational interviewing. You want to express empathy. Empathy is not feeling sorry for them. That's sympathy. Empathy is being able to put yourself in their shoes and see it from their point of view. But expressing empathy doesn't necessarily mean that since you accept them as a person, you agree with everything they're doing or saying. You want to help them develop the discrepancies. They say they want to stop drinking, but they stop by the bar to say hello to their friends every night after work because without going to the bar, they won't have any friends. And eh, how is that working? Uh, you want to roll with the resistance as the counselor. Resistance is normal. It's part of the process of change. And you want to support what we call self-efficacy, the client's belief that if they try, they can change. Counselors need to develop influencing skills. And I've learned over the time I've been doing this work that it's kind of like a dance. You're not, you can't learn all the steps to the dance from uh, an instruction booklet or watching a video. You have to get up and practice them. Sometimes we take a step and we step on a client's toes and we back off. But some of the influencing skills that you need to learn and then to practice to become proficient at. One is interpretation, you know, trying to find meaning in what they're saying. Normalizing, many people think they're unique and different when in fact what they're going through is probably pretty typical for where they're at in life and the experiences they've had. Some providing some context, you know, if you look at the picture here, we've got uh, people in different parts of their life possibly. So what would be normal for someone in their childhood, their teens, their 20s, would be very different from the experiences somebody might have as they go through midlife or retirement or elderly years. If there's one skill a counselor or therapist must have, it's the ability to reframe. Anytime you can pick something up, turn it around and look at it from another angle, it can be helpful. Anytime a client says to you, I have never thought of it that way, you've had a successful session. Uh, another expression is be careful not to eat the client's soup and then tell them what it tastes like. You know, sometimes uh, we want to do the growing for the client, but growth can come from the process of struggling. So trying to make it too easy for them can sometimes interfere with their ability to believe they can do it without you. Some more influencing skills can include confrontation, and this is appropriate confrontation, pointing out discrepancies within the client's statements, between the statements and the behavior, and you should always look for client's strengths versus their weaknesses. Strengths can always be built on, but sometimes weaknesses are strengths that just haven't been developed yet. 
and you want to uh, look at the differences, the discrepancies between client statements versus what you see in their appearance and their behavior. Another example of looking for change talk comes in, in the uh, area of uh, what I would call the theories of solution-focused brief therapy or narrative therapy. The idea that sometimes we can stay too hung up and looking at the problem instead of looking for the solution. And sometimes it's hard for the person uh, not to see the solution because they're so used to telling themselves negative things. So some of the change talk you want to look for, attend to, reinforce is when was this not a problem? If there was ever a, a year where they got through the year without uh, drinking or using, what was different then? Uh, you could ask, what would be better if this changed? How would you know if this had happened? What if it was, what was it like when there was no problem? What do you most hope for? Uh, another thing you might say is, if at some point in the future, you woke up one day and you didn't have this problem anymore, how would your life have changed? So all of this change talk uh, helps people to believe that it's possible for their life to be different. Some core motivational interviewing skills, really core uh, counseling skills, I believe, are one, open-ended questions. Avoid questions that can be answered yes and no, and instead ask questions like, can you tell me more about that? Uh, or giving them a round of applause. The counselor needs to affirm the client. Rather than pointing out the one thing they did wrong this last week, you need to attend to uh, affirm all of the things they have done. Reflective listening, you listen, but not just as a uh-huh, uh-huh kind of listening. Listen for what's behind it. Reflect back to them the feelings. They tell you a story and you say, wow, that sounds like you really were hurt by that. And they will say, yes, that hurt me. Uh, reflect back the meaning behind it. Uh, that must have left you uh, feeling this way or thinking this thing. And part of what we do in, in open-ended uh, motivational interviewing skills is summarizing what they've said. You go through a long thing and you say, so the bottom line sounds like, and you add it all up. And there are many different uh, verbal ways of doing this. You don't want to fall into the pattern of saying it exactly the same way to the same client every week. Sometimes it takes a while for people to become ready to change. And there are ways that we can help improve that readiness. One is to spend uh, some time on decisional balance. How important is this? What is the good part of using? What's the good part of quitting? What's the bad part of using? The bad part of quitting. What are the pros and cons? Uh, one way of, of helping that might be to have them make up a, uh, a list of how much money they were spending each week on drugs and alcohol, over how many weeks, over how many years, how much have they spent on this uh, activity? Another is uh, looking at readiness. Different stages of change for different problems. It's common for clients to come in. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a client who came in very ready to give up methamphetamine, knew it was messing up his life. But after being in the program for a while, suddenly he returned a dirty drug test for marijuana. He had to re-examine whether he was ready to give up the marijuana. Yes, he'd been willing to give up the math, but would he do that? So he decided to give up the weed for a period of time, maybe long enough to get clean drug tests and get off probation. Then one weekend he was gone and he didn't show up for class for a few days. And when he came back, he'd had a relapse. And we discussed his relapse, what caused that? And he said, well, the reason I relapsed and relapse was on meth uh, was steak. I said, what, steak? How could steak have caused your relapse? He said, well, I went to a family event, barbecue. We were sitting there talking and suddenly someone cracked open a beer and slid it across the table to me. And I never even thought about that I'm not supposed to be drinking alcohol on, on probation right now. I just had it and I had another and another and then I was feeling really groggy 
and I went right down the street to my dealer and I got some meth and to take the edge off. And that started a, a multi-day run. So I said, well, what do you want to do about that? And, and at that point, we were able to restart his program. He, he couldn't, uh, there had to be consequences, but we restarted it for another 90 days. He said, well, what I think I should do is give up alcohol also. So we added that alcohol to his treatment program. A few weeks later, he came into group and he announced to the group, hey, I'm, I've quit smoking cigarettes. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, that's not on your treatment plan. I'm not sure you're allowed to do that. And he said, yeah. I said, well, why are you giving up cigarettes? And he said, because I noticed every morning when I have my coffee and I take that lighter out and I flick it to light my cigarette and I smell that lighter fluid, I want to go smoke that crack pipe, but just something fierce. See, here he was in different stages of change for different problems and gradually worked his way through the stages of change, adding more things to the list of substances and activities he wanted to give up. Another thing that you can do to help uh, people work on their readiness to change is this problem you're dealing with, the meth use, the drinking, whatever, how important on a scale of zero to 10 would it be, or zero to 100, would it be to change? And then second, how confident are you that you could do this? By doing this on a regular basis, weekly or whatever, you get an idea of whether uh, the client is making progress towards stopping and whether they're becoming more confident that they can stay stopped. This is the point in the class where I would normally spend some time discussing the ASI, the Addiction Severity Index. You can find a free copy on the ASI training edition, a paper one you can print out and take a look at. But uh, there's another whole set of videos that I put up on YouTube that is used in our class on the core functions, the job duties of a drug counselor. Assessment in substance abuse is typically very different than it is in mental health. In mental health, we are looking at impairments in order to arrive at a diagnosis. In substance abuse, we pretty well have the diagnosis up front, a drug or alcohol problem or a behavioral addiction. We are trying to assess for what parts of the person's life have been damaged. And so this ASI is either a paper or online assessment of how has the uh, drug using or alcohol using experience affected their relationships, their work, their time in jail, their physical health, um, all of those other aspects. And do they need more education? Do they need job training, etc.? So it's also looking at life skills they will need to learn in order to maintain a clean and healthy uh, lifestyle. At this point in the class, I would be asking students what you should have learned. And three of the important lessons one would be to understand the stages of change and how people move through it, particularly to understand that in the stages of change model, relapse is seen as failure to do the maintenance step. When we look at the 12 steps and 12 traditions, and in class I would have encouraged the students to look at the pages in the textbook that cover the 12 steps, which step involves taking a good look at yourself? And the answer I'm looking here at is the fourth and then the fifth step. And to me, counseling, therapy, taking a good look at yourself and then being ready to change, working on changing yourself, the fourth and fifth step, is really an essential part of therapy or counseling. Lastly, which tradition prevents AA from accepting money from non-members? Well, the seventh tradition says that self-help groups are different from professional counseling and therapy. Professional counseling and therapy is often paid for by funding sources such as insurance or uh, criminal justice or child protective services, welfare, so on. Self-help groups are paid for by their members and in the AA and other 12-step traditions, they decline outside uh, contributions 
so that the members pay for the costs of having the self-help group available.